Private Lender Podcast, Episode 44. The Private Lender Podcast quote of the day comes to us from Henry David Thoreau, who said, Wealth is the ability to fully experience life. This is the Private Lender Podcast, the show that shares practical advice and know-how for new and seasoned lenders, from private mortgages on single-family houses to joint ventures on commercial projects and beyond. Discover details about investment vehicles that you won't find at your local bank or online broker. Listen and learn from private lenders and real estate investors, as well as from professionals and entrepreneurs, as they share the details, strategies, and the insight that allows for successful and prosperous lending. Now, get ready to increase your ROI. Here's your host, Keith Baker. Hello, Lender Nation, and welcome to the Private Lender Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to teaching you how to safely invest in the most passive form of real estate investing by mitigating risks. I'm your host, Keith Baker, and I'm on a mission to create an alternative economy where people like you and I can confidently invest and build wealth without banks or Wall Street. You're listening to episode 44, and today I'll be discussing whether you should require a loan application or not, and what type of information would be beneficial or is the most important on a loan application. But before we get into the heart of that matter, I'd like to thank you for sharing your most valuable asset with me today, and that is your time. Time is the one thing that both the rich and the poor have in common. Everyone gets 24 hours in a day, no more, no less. The man who sleeps on the street has the exact same amount of time as the man who sleeps in an ivory tower. How you spend your time makes a huge difference in life, and I'm grateful that you're spending your time with me today. I'd also like to give a shout out and a thank you to Sammy Gupta at County Tax Sale App for their sponsorship of this episode. This episode of the Private Lender Podcast is proudly sponsored by CountyTaxSaleApp.org. With CountyTaxSaleApp.org, you get a very powerful lead generation tool in the palm of your hand, on your laptop, desktop, or any device you choose. Get real-time alerts for between 300 and 600 properties every month that are coming up for the foreclosure auction in Harris County, Texas, the third largest county in the United States. With this intuitive design and interface, the County Tax Sale app lets you search all properties with highly motivated sellers that are coming up for foreclosure auction. Simply search the map and click on a property to learn important details about that property, such as the address, owner's contact info, minimum bid, and a street view photo. You can save properties to your favorites and contact the sellers directly and receive email and text alerts if one of your favorite properties is redeemed or canceled prior to the auction. You can even listen to Sammy Gupta on episode 28 of this podcast as he discusses all the powerful features and benefits of countytaxsaleapp.org. For more information, go to the Private Lender Podcast sponsor page, the show notes page for this episode, or to countytaxsaleapp.org. That's countytaxsaleapp.org. And I highly recommend you go check out countytaxsaleapp.org. Even if you don't live in Houston or Texas or even the United States, you can research properties in Harris County, foreclosure properties, anywhere in the world on any device for less than three cents a day. And I'd also like to thank Landon and Ray over at 713 RIA for their continued sponsorship of the Private Lender Podcast. And I'd like to encourage you, the listener, to visit me on the second Wednesday of every month at the 713 RIA meeting. It's held at the Holiday Inn Express at 125 Airtex Boulevard and I-45 North in Houston. Okay, now that we've paid the bills... Let's get to the heart of the show. I'd like to pose two questions to you. First question is, do you require an application or would you require an application of any borrower? Now, when I loan to people like Chris Funk or my partner Landon or like a Ray Sasser, I'm in the industry enough with them that I don't require an application. Maybe I should. I do require proof of identification, though. However, I don't always necessarily want or need to take an application from somebody, an investor like that. However, if I don't know you, you don't have a track record. If you don't have a track record, I'm not going to loan to you. But if I'm not familiar with you, or if it's a new venture, a new joint venture, or a new investment, I will require an application from that borrower just so that I get some background. And it helps me underwrite the loan. So that first question is, do you require it? Is going to be up to you. I would like to say, you know, everyone fills out the same form. I have all that information. But again, if you're comfortable with somebody, you may not need that application. I would suggest you verify that they have the funds to pay you back and the reserves to be able to afford the loan. But the application itself, the actual formal application, you might not want to use. That's up to you. It's going to be a judgment call. And full disclosure, I don't always require an application. But it's good practice. 
and repeat loans to the same borrower, again, that's going to be your call depending on your comfort level with that borrower. And then the second question, if you do require an application, what information do you ask for or should you ask for? And this is where things can get a little hairy and personal. The deeper you go into somebody's background, the better protected you are. However, the beauty of going to a private lender is not having to get the financial autopsy that the banks like to perform and some hard money lenders like to do. While you want to protect yourself, you want to mitigate the risks. You also don't want to make it so incredibly difficult for the borrower that they might as well just pay a few more interest rate points or just points on the loan to get the hard money without the hassle. So I'm going to go over a few things with you right now that I like to require. And that is first off the investor's name, all that good stuff, contact information, home phone, cell phone, work number, email addresses, the address that they live at. If they have a business address, if they're borrowing in the name of a company, I want to know all that information about that, like say an LLC, for example. And I'd also like to have the information on their spouse if they're borrowing as an individual. If they're borrowing as a company, it's a different topic for a different day. I would still get a personal guarantee from that person, which may give you some flack, but I like to see skin in the game. That's just me. But when my borrowers have skin in the game, I feel a lot better and a lot more confident about making them a loan. So if your investor, your your borrower is doing it as an individual and not in an entity, an INC, an LLC, or a limited partnership or any, you know, an entity, get the spouse's information and have the name of the spouse on the promissory note and a deed of trust. So after I got the personal information, I want to see what they say they make as far as their income, whether it's a base income, if they have a full-time job, or if they're a full-time investor, which in itself is a full-time job, but may not generate a W-2 for that person. But I, I just kind of want to know about that. I also want to ask them about their real estate investing experience right up front, because this is what I'm, outside of the financial information, I'm really going to follow up on this the most on somebody that I'm not familiar with. And this goes back to the people, the process and the property, the way I underwrite a loan, the way I look at it. And so I want to see what that person's process is. Are they a landlord? Are they a rehabber? If so, how many have they done? How many make readies? How many properties have they turned around? With a low-grade rehab, how many properties have they done a full rehab? Have they gutted the house down to studs? Have they had to rip out a pool and fill in the backyard? I'm sure everyone out there has had to pull at least one hot tub out from somewhere and get rid of it somehow. At least on the application, I want to find out a little bit more about them in that regard. Not so much on the application, but I want to see their portfolio. It's kind of hard to do that in the application, but in the application, I let them know. If you say you flipped 50 houses, great. Let me see the HUD statements. Let me see some photos, maybe a Google Drive. If they're a full-time real estate investor, they're going to have documents and records of pretty much everything they've put their hands on. So I'd like to see if they are who they are. If they say they've done 10 flips, 10 rehabs, fine. Let me see before and after. Let me see the HUD where you purchased it. I guess it's called the closing statement. Now I have to ask my title agent or escrow officer. But I want to see the HUD when they bought the property. And I'd like to see the HUD when they sold the property. So if they bought it for 120000 and fixed it up and sold it for two fifty, I'd like to see that. I want to see success. I also want to see failures, not to disqualify or to exclude anybody, but if someone's going to be honest and say, yeah, I screwed up on this one, this is what I did wrong, I'm going to be more apt to loan to that person because they're honest. They made mistakes. They know that in the game, life, no one's perfect, but it's when you try to cover things up and make yourself as you're the expert and you're really not, that's... Now I get into an underwriting area where it's like, mm, I learned a long time ago in the oil field, it's best just to fess up, admit you're wrong, and do what it takes to fix the problem. I actually learned it earlier, but it really came together for me when I was working in the oil field. And I saw a lot of people, some of the guys were you know, straight up honest and everything. Uh, others did not want to admit they made a mistake. And I can tell you with full disclosure that it's very humbling when you make a $400,000 mistake, especially when that $400,000 belongs to somebody else. And I know because I did it and I actually kept my job. And I think the only reason I did is because I fessed up and explained exactly what I did wrong and what I've done to, to make sure that it never happened again. And I didn't get fired from Slumber's Day, believe it or not. So that's what I want to see in their portfolio and their experience. I want to see the good, the bad. I want to see the ugly. I want to see everything warts and all. Let me see what you do. So to recap, 
when you're taking a loan application or if you are insisting that someone fills out a loan application, try to at least get their personal information, all the contact, where they live. And I like two forms of ID. I like a driver's license and a social security card. However, this can open up an area that I think we should get into a little further discussion. When you start taking personal information like that, you need to secure it. So oftentimes what I like to have the borrower do is provide their driver's license and social security card at closing. Now they have to provide their driver's license at closing to prove who they are because these are notarized documents. So you get that automatically. You'll get a copy of it. On the application, you can put the driver's license number or the social security number. I like to leave that off of the application, but to get a copy of it somehow, some way, put it in a file cabinet or put it in a very, very secured digital environment, whatever a secure digital environment means, I guess. But before someone jumps up, especially an attorney saying, hey, you're collecting personal data, you're right. You want to be very extremely, extremely careful with how you handle it. I have a lock safe, or I'm sorry, lock safe. I have a file cabinet that's like a safe that locks. And when I get my closing documents, I put a copy of the driver's license and or social security card in there and keep it there. I don't like to keep it in email form or in Dropbox or anything like that. I like to try to keep it as safe as possible. Or even if I need to put it in a safety deposit box at a bank with uh, some of my other valuable documents. But that's something you want to consider when you're taking it. And don't not do a loan because you don't want to do that. But I'm just saying, be aware of what you need to do, that you need to be protective of other people's information. Because just think if you're in their shoes, you would want that same courtesy and that same respect with your information. So I kind of went down that rabbit hole. Okay, so we got personal information, contact, where they live, how many properties that they've lived at, when have they moved there recently, have they been there forever, that kind of thing. Also, just a brief description of their monthly income. I want to see... You know, and this is all you just check it to verify, see if anyone's lying at the end of the day. Some folks, they go into the assets and liabilities. That is a different conversation. I don't put that on the application. I like to see that in the portfolio, which will be another episode. And of course, the real estate investing experience is crucial, especially to someone you don't know or you're not familiar with. You want to see a track record of a certain type of investing that you're comfortable lending to or lending on. And while past performance is no guarantee of future success, it can be a pretty darn good indicator. All right, I think that's going to do it for episode 44. We're coming up on 52 here real soon. Can't believe it's going to be a year, just about eight episodes. That's uh, eight or nine. That's going to be something. So now's the time when I grovel with you. Oh, dear listener, please go rate and review on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever whatever platform you use to listen to this golden gilded voice of mine. And you can use that. Go ahead and promote your business in the review. I would love to be able to read a review that promotes your business in iTunes or on the air, promote your passion or promote whatever niche that you invest in. I'd love to hear about it. And seriously, I mean, drop in your website, your email, your phone number, whatever. If I can help you in the investing world, then by all means, I would love for you to share the platform that I have to help you do that also like to ask you to spread the word, connect with me on social media, at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Bigger Pockets, or at the privatelenderpodcast.com. And once again, I want to thank you for listening and sharing your time with me today. And I'd like to wish everyone listening happy, safe, and prosperous private lending. I'll catch you on the next episode. And this is coming in hot off the press. If you'd like more information on, on how to become a successful, confident, and prosperous private lender, then go to privatelenderacademy.com and join the waiting list. When you do, you'll get just a couple of emails. I will be very sparing with the emails, but I will let you know when the Private Lender Academy launches. And I'll also be seeking beta testers. So in exchange for you going through the course and getting that information, I'd like a little bit of feedback, just a couple of questions on what you found helpful or what you found lacking, so on and so forth. And you'll get modules for free. At some point, I do want to charge for the Private Lender Academy, but I really want to put a class and quality product out there. So if you have any interest at all, and if you've given me your email before, you know I don't spam. You can take that to the bank. But go to privatelenderacademy.com, enter your name and your email. I'll let you know when things get closer to the launch. I'm getting really excited. 
It's a lot of work. I was hoping to launch in January of 2019. I'm still hopeful, but I'm going to try to get it together as soon as I can. So privatelenderacademy.com, get on the waiting list. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Private Lender Podcast with your host, Keith Baker. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit privatelenderpodcast.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review, and we'll catch you next time.